movement and the charismatic adjunct to it have electrified the religious world because it is well known that indeed we have lived to see a renaissance of these things in our generation. For many years they were left untended and unnoticed. And then suddenly there comes up the charismata, the abundance of spiritual gifts that God has given unto men. Now, once again, when I discuss the tremendous power that is packed in the gifts, you must bear in mind that you are not by any means eligible for gifts until you have the fruit. But once you are in place and in balance in doing the work that God has called you to do, there is tremendous potential of what God will do for you and what God will do in you. The the uh, analogy that Christ gives is the best one that you can even imagine. He said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And when he said that, he made a tremendous concession, a concession that he had not made before. He made other analogies that he was the head and we're the body. He is the cornerstone, we're the building. And he is the shepherd, and we're the flock. All of these are analogies that he made, but only on the last night that he was with his disciples in the upper room did he make the absolutely most telling and the most intimate and, and the most uh, pungent of all of his analogies of his relationship with his disciples, with us, all of his followers. We are his disciples. When he said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. When he said that, he is saying that we are of the same essence, we are of the same nature, we are of the same spirit. In other words, what the vine is, the branch must be also. It cannot be other than what the vine is. But now then, if, if we are of the same essence and of the same nature, of the same spirit, we are also of the same purpose. We have the very same purpose. What the vine is intended to do, the branch must do. In fact, the Lord here reveals his dependency upon uh, us, upon you and me. There is no way he will speak to people today except through us. There is no way his word will be declared except by us. There is no way that his works will be done save by us. If you want to know what the Lord expects you to do in this generation, in your generation, all you have to do is ask one question, what would Jesus do if he were upon the earth? If you can answer that, then you know what he expects you to do. Now, when Jesus came, he was hindered and hurt by several different attitudes that he had to face. One of these was a, a disbelief that he, a Nazarene, could be the Son of God. Another was the extravagant, uh, exorbitant expectations of the Jewish people. They had had several hundred years to embroider their beliefs and, and to create a great and extravagant tapestry of what they believed the Messiah would do until their expectations were beyond reality. Their expectations were far beyond what they imagined, or, or they, what they imagined was far beyond what the Lord had from the very beginning been destined to come to earth to do. For instance, they believed at the time that Jesus came that he would expel uh, the enemy from their shores and that he would sit upon the throne and rule the people in peace. They expected that he would uh, bring uh, healing upon all the land. And one of the great expectations was that the barren women 
would uh, bring forth children and some of them expected that they would have a child a year. They believed that the land would flow literally with milk and honey. That you could see milk and honey as they flowed uh, down the uh, uh, countryside, the landscape. They believed and expected things that were never a part of the promise and never a part of the purpose of the Messiah when he came. And once again, this is an incident of the devils causing such over, over zeal and expectation that you miss the reality. He came to be a spiritual blessing and a spiritual leader. So what would he be doing today? Now then, don't imagine things that are not listed in the Word of God. Put your faith in this Word and find balance in Him. Now, if He expects me to be the branch and Him the vine, then He has this expectation that I will bear His fruit. I will be showing to the whole world the fruit of Jesus Christ in my life. But not only that, I must be of the uh, same purpose of him. I must do his work. And for that reason, he gives me gifts. He gives me gifts that, that empower me and help me to do the work that he would do if he were here. Now, whatever he would be doing, that is what he wishes his church, his people to be doing right now. We have to do it through him. We have to do it according to his sovereignty. Now then, the one great thing we have to bear in mind is that he shares with us this essence. He shares with us this purpose, but he does not share with us his sovereignty. He is God. He is God, and he must remain God in all of our understanding. And every now and then, every now and then, even in Pentecostal circles, the oldest of all temptations comes to us in very insidious ways. The oldest of all temptations was that to Adam and Eve, that you should take and eat of this fruit because your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods. Now the devil became the devil in his desire to replace and supplant God when he said, I will be like the most high. And so on. Now then every now and then it crops up among us that someone begins to lay claim upon things that have absolutely no backing in scripture and they claim and arrogate to themselves rights and powers and positions that do not belong to him uh, or to us. They belong to Jesus Christ only he is God. Amen. And I have heard it said recently and I don't want to get into this tonight don't intend to that when we pray and we say, thy will be done, that is a cop-out. I am supposed to be able to demand of God what I want done. I am supposed to be to, uh, able to declare it with certainty what I want done. Now that is a far-fetched notion. Jesus himself prayed, thy will be done. And we are to pray, thy will be done. Who are you and who am I to imagine that our little finite minds are a match for the infinite wisdom of God? He knows better than I. He knows far better than I. Now then we're going to review these things tonight with that one thing emphasized, and I cannot emphasize it to you too much because it is the, it, this is the very vulnerable point where the devil will try to overthrow and overcome the Pentecostal movement. And he will do it. He will do everything he can to sow in us the seeds of our own demise if we are on guard against him at all times. There was a time in the... Uh, well, years ago, the Pentecostal movement was not quite as uh, old as it is now. I was a young minister at the time. This was back in the very, very early uh, 40s. Probably it was 40 or 41. 
in there. There were some people when a lady became sick. Here's a girl, that, a young woman, that was a very, very fine Christian lady. And she became very sick. The people gathered around her and they did what sometimes we are urged to do. To demand that God heal her. Demand it, demand it, demand it. And to badger God rather than to appeal to God. And do more than to importune God to continue to ask and for His will to be done. But to make certain demands upon God. And that was called having faith. Now when this happened, uh, the woman was indeed healed. She did indeed uh, have rest restoration of her health. Almost by the time she was really up and going again, she backslid, began to live a debauched life, was in an accident, and died, and went out into eternity, unprepared to meet God. Now I had to listen to those people grieve because they were not willing to let her die full of glory. Now I'm not going to try to explain to you theological ramifications of it. I'm just telling you that their attitude sowed the seeds of their own despair. That's all. I'm saying, I'm not saying how it happened or why. My next door neighbor in Cleveland, Tennessee for 12 years was a large, obese, beer drinking, cigar smoking, profane man. He sat around his swimming pool with his feet in the air and he was a very, very unhappy, unfortunate, embittered man. Now he had been a Church of God preacher. Along came these extravagant notions, these kinds of urgent insistences. This man had a daughter that had been born to him with a birth defect. This man now emboldened and encouraged by some of these extravagant notions began to make his demands upon God and lay his demands upon God. I demand who are you to demand that God do anything? He then began to make his boast that if there is a God, my daughter will be healed. If there is a God, she will be healed. When he did that and she was not healed, he fell into the net of his own making. And he backslid. And so far as I know, he is still today in that backslidden condition. What I'm trying to tell you is that God will give us all of these. But there are times that he will say no to your original request because he has a bigger yes coming down the road. Now then, who am I to know what he has in store for me? Who are you to know? He knows so much, much, much more than I know. Let me give you another clear example of it. There was a man in the English Restoration time, who was a popular, popular preacher. People came to hear him by the hundreds and sometimes thousands. 
But the church of England, the state church, ordered him to cease preaching. But he would not quit preaching. And they arrested him and put him in jail. Frequently, these authorities, not wishing to hold this popular preacher in prison, let him know that if he would give them their, his assurance that they would, he would not preach anymore, they would let him go. He always let them know that if you turn me loose this morning, I will be preaching somewhere tonight. His name was John Bunyan. John Bunyan lay in the Bedford prison, and his autobiography, Grace Abounding, and other writings of John Bunyan indicate how thousands of people were praying for his release. They were praying for these things to be done. And he hurt because the poor sheep were out there without a shepherd. And still he was not released. God, you see, had a higher glory for John Bunyan. Because while he was in that prison, he dreamed a dream. And he wrote it down. And it was called the Pilgrim's Progress. Now then, he did not preach to the thousands. He preached instead to millions. And even today, when you read what he wrote, I think it is something that is inspired just beneath even the inspiration of the Bible. I don't put it on the par with the Bible, so don't misunderstand me. But I certainly see the inspiration of the Lord upon his work. The Lord didn't want him. There was a toughness and a tenacity and a faithfulness bred in those people by his absence. And there was also in him something that would far exceed his own life. Now, let us look and see the scriptures. The Lord delivered Peter from the prison, right? Amen. Can God deliver from prisons? Of course. Paul languished in the Mamertine prison in Rome. Did God deliver him? No. Did God deliver James? No. He delivered Peter? Yes. I'm only showing you that God has a sovereign will and I for one am quite willing and ready to bow and say, Thy will be done. And don't you try to tag me with the notion that that is a lack of faith. That is a moment of supreme faith. That it just doesn't matter. I'm like Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I'm like the three young Hebrew boys that says it's just like if he may deliver us out of the burning fiery furnace, but it doesn't really matter whether he does or not. Because we still won't bow down and worship the image which you have set up. Now we're not arrogant enough to know precisely what God is going to will. But if he does or if he doesn't, it's all the same. We're going to live for Him nonetheless. Amen. Now that's my attitude. And then the result is that most of the times God answers me with a positive affirmation of my request. Almost always. But if He doesn't, it is because I know that down the road there is coming a greater blessing. There is coming a greater purpose that I may not even understand. Praise God. 
I looked in my journal this afternoon. And do you know what I found out happened on this college campus two years ago? While I was here on this college campus two years ago, I had it recorded in my journal and had quite forgotten it because I didn't know when the seed was sown. <laughs> but while I was here, a number of the students of this school back then talked to me about how I needed to give up administrative work and go full time into what I was doing then. That was the planting of a seed. And here I am doing that very thing. You see, there are some who have already suggested that I was kind of nutty. Why give up a position? Why give up an office? Why give up a salary? I did it because I think that's what God wants me to do. Do you understand? And I know that somehow, some way, somewhere, I will recognize that it was him who led people on this campus to begin to plant those seeds in my heart over two years ago. Praise God forevermore. It was a good seed planted and it continued to grow and to flourish and here I am. I don't have to rush back to Roanoke, Virginia or anywhere else except where Ed is. <laughs> And if I had her out here with me, I wouldn't care if we stayed another week. I always want her to be with me. So if you ever want one of those prolonged visits, you better see to it I bring her. You understand? My point is, we have to be willing to throw ourselves totally and completely upon Him and expect that He will direct our lives. And I believe it with all of my heart. Amen. Now, let's look at it. We covered these quite thoroughly. But now then we're here. Words of wisdom. The most common way that this happens is right now. When a preacher is in the pulpit, man, every one of you who is a preacher, those of you who are going to be preachers will see it. You're going to learn more of preaching than you'll probably learn in a study. Because there'll be flashes of insight that'll come to you when the anointing is upon you that you had never thought of before. And then and there it is. It's a word of wisdom that begins to work and to happen in your heart and in your life as you begin to understand under the duress of anointed preaching things that you had never really thought of before. And the congregation sitting out there doesn't know that you're learning as much as they are. <laughs> From your own preaching. Because the Lord is has an interchange going with you in which there come flashes of insight and inspiration that you have not known or even thought of before. The same thing about knowledge. But then we come to the discerning of spirits. And I had to leave that one woefully short this morning. And so I must get on to it now. A discerning of spirits, you're going to live in a world and you're going to go out into a world that is full of foulsome spirits. And you're going to be up against them very often. I remember one time when I was preaching in Omaha, Nebraska. When I got up to preach, a man sitting back in the congregation interrupted my sermon to ask a question. I answered it. Then he did it again. I said, will you please hold it until I have finished the sermon. I have a message he wanted me to know for the people. I said, so do I have a message. And I am the one that God has called upon to deliver that message, so I'll deliver mine instead of your delivering yours. He finally reeled out at me and said, I know you. I know you because you have the same spirit I have. And I have been baptized with hell fire. Well, there was a direct confrontation To the minister, by the devil himself. 
and it had to be dealt with. And there was no one there but me. The Lord here had already exercised the discerning of spirits for me to know what he was. And when I went down and took hold of him and looked into his eyes, it was actually like I was looking in the coals of fire. But the devil had to be dealt with. And the Lord merged this one with this one to expel that demon spirit from that congregation. <coughs> Not long ago, I was at another school about a lot like this. And I was speaking, as long as I'm speaking right now, and I was telling how the Lord has power over the devil. And he does. And back halfway in the audience, a young girl began to scream and screech. And she began to shake herself violently and to curse and to hurl her cursing. To me. She cursed me. Oh, how often I've had this to happen. The devil literally seized hold of this young girl to defy the message of God. Well, once again, God had been challenged. And the Holy Ghost upon me, I left the pulpit, walked down into the audience, and went back to the young woman. And when I laid hands on her, she screamed as if I had touched her with a hot piece of <coughs> red hot metal, and collapsed to the floor. And there on the floor she writhed. And finally she calmed down as we prayed over her. And then she got up. Now then she was rational and sane. And she gave a testimony that the Lord had delivered her. And the last time I heard, she was still serving God and a beautiful Christian. All of this comes here. You don't have to be intimidated by the devil. The devil is no more a match for you than he was for Jesus Christ. If you will live for him. Amen. 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 Now, the Lord reveals to us the need and the Lord will do his need through us and comes now to faith and healing and miracles a healing is the correcting of a disorder that is simply organic. When you are sick, you need healing. And notice that the Bible calls it gifts of healing. There are, why are there gifts of healing? Because there are so many kinds of sickness in the world today. There are true organic sicknesses and maladies and diseases. They're psychosomatic diseases. There are, we live in a sick world in which the world has all kinds of illnesses about it. And therefore we have to have the gifts of healing. My wife 
was sick with a fibroid tumor. Our youngest, I mean our oldest daughter, our second child, was born. And when Sarah was born, the same one who died 26 years later, it was discovered that my wife had a serious fibroid tumor that seemed to be about as large as a grapefruit. And the doctor confirmed it with consultation to other doctors, with other doctors. Finally, they scheduled my wife for surgery. Now here is a woman who is filled with the Holy Ghost and who is sick with a fibroid tumor. And I, the husband, began to pray unto God until in praying for this, God exercised this and he exercised this. And I knew that she was healed. I had been down to the surgeon to talk with him where he had scheduled her for surgery. And he said, Reverend Khan, don't even hope for a miracle. Said, you have already had your miracle. Said, because for the child to be born and alive and your wife to be alive, those are two miracles there. Now then all we can hope for is to remove that tumor by surgery. Our state overseer came up to where I was pastoring in St. Joseph, Missouri. And they gathered around my wife and we began to pray. And the longer we prayed, the worse I felt because I had already received the answer. And finally, I actually interrupted the prayer. And I said, please, <coughs> let me tell you that I have already been assured of the Lord that my wife is healed. The fine people that were praying said, then let us praise the Lord. And we praised Him. My wife then went to the physician, did not tell him anything about it. But when he examined her, he said, Mrs. Khan, I am a, at a total loss to understand what has happened. Said, last week you had a fibroid tumor in your schedule for surgery, but today you don't have a sign of a fibroid tumor at all. Now that was healing. That was a healing because here is an organic disorder that needed to be corrected by the power of God and was. But now then, and listen to me very carefully, because here is one of those times where the devil would like to shove us flat of our faces. There are some sicknesses that come about because of demon possession. No question about it. So I want us to look at that and look at it very, very carefully. In the consideration of the third operative gift, the working of miracles, we find in a rather comprehensive study of the gifts of the Spirit that Harold Horton defines a miracle in this way. A miracle, therefore, is a supernatural intervention in the ordinary course of nature. A temporary suspension of the accustomed order. An interruption of the system of nature as we know it. The gift of the working of miracles operates by the energy or dynamic force of the Spirit in reversals or suspensions of natural laws. A miracle is a sovereign act of the Spirit of God irrespective of laws or systems. A miracle does not, as some cynical unbelievers say, 
demand the existence of an undiscovered law to explain it. A miracle has no explanation other than the sovereign power of the Lord. God is not bound by his own laws. God acts as he will, either within or outside of what we understand to be laws, whether natural or supernatural. So to speak of God as though he were circumscribed by the laws of his own making is to reduce him to the creature plane and impair the very essence of his eternal attributes. When in a sudden and sovereign act, God steps outside the circle by which his creatures or creation are boundary, we call it a miracle. And so does God in scripture. <laughs> so said Harold Hall in describing what a miracle is. A person who has a demon in him will need a miracle to cast him out. One thing that we can be very, very sure of is that he does indeed cast out miracles. I have seen occasions go Lord where demons have been cast out. Jesus cast the demons out of Mary Magdalene. So, he also came up against a man called Legion. A Legion is a Roman military force of 6,000 men. This means, if we could take it literally, whether that is, well, of course, is not for us to know. That man had so many demons in him that his name was Legion. And when those demons were cast out, they ran into a herd of 2,000 hogs and there were more demons in one man than 2,000 hogs could stand. They ran down the hill into the sea and were drowned. Now then, this being true, I want you to notice the Word of God. If you'll turn on page 130 and let us read from the Scriptures. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his Word. And healed all that were sick. Notice that it is not one and the same. It is and. And his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments and those, and those which were possessed with devils. Notice that there is a clear distinction between those who are sick and those who are, cast, or those who are possessed of devils. Now, read all of those scriptures that I have given you. And yet we have some today who have made and would make Christian Holy Ghost filled people fearful that a devil will get in them. That's right. And I have been in meetings where someone says, now I'm about to cast the devil out of this man. So everybody bow your head so the devil won't get in you. Well, I have never yet done that. And I won't go through life ducking and bowing and bobbing and weaving and twisting to keep a devil from getting in me. Amen. You can walk through devils up to your eyeball. And he won't get in you. If the Holy Ghost is in there. And nothing more infuriates me than to see people planting fear in the hearts of the people of God by suggesting that they can get a devil. No way! You see, here's where you need the discerning of spirits. Two men are blind. One is blind because of an optic nerve disease. One is blind because of a demon. The discerning of spirits will tell you which is which and what is what. Whether one needs healing or one needs a miracle. You understand? No devil can possess a child 
of God. Now, I am told constantly, oh, yes, Brother Con, because the Bible says, the Bible says that a devil is cast out of a man, and then when that happens, the devil will come back. So he can come back, and he can possess a man all over again, and one of the biggest things I have is trying to help people, Christian people, to realize, hey, you don't have a devil in you. If a knife can cut it out, it ain't no devil. You can't cut one out. You can't burn one out. They're not afraid of sulfur tablets or penicillin or any other. For me to think that when I am doing work and I get a chill and I get a cold, a devil got in me. All I got to do now is put my feet in hot water and drink hot lemonade. Yeah. The devil can't take hot lemonade. <laughs> and he'll come out. If I burn my feet in hot water and guzzle down hot lemonade, the devil can't take it. The devil comes out. That's plum city. Just plum city. Because you see, that is not by any means what the Lord is talking about. He is talking about something that cannot happen and does not happen by uh, any means. Now I want you to notice what the Lord has to say. Let us find out uh, uh, what the Lord has said at this very time about the demon that comes in. If I can find it immediately. It's here in the book. And if you will uh, uh, help me to locate it immediately, I'll appreciate that. It's under the section about the demons and the uh, child of God. Has anyone found it? Someone just help me to find the, uh, the uh, scripture. Oh, I can read it. I'm very sorry to uh, not have it come to me immediately. Oh, I was looking right at it. I thought so, but it is. I've changed my Bibles and didn't recognize it. Here it is. It's in the uh, 12th chapter of Matthew, beginning in verse 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he said, I will return to my house from whence I have come out. And when he has come, he findeth an empty swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it also be under this wicked generation. I have had official complaints lodged against me through the years for saying what I have just been saying. I have had people to declare that I'm preaching a negative gospel by declaring what I've just declared. That a devil cannot possess a Christian. A devil cannot possess a child of God. A devil cannot come across the bloodline of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No way. No way. So, I was speaking in uh, the state of Washington and someone wanted to ask her a question. I said, Brother Con, would you explain how the devil can uh, uh, possess your spirit, but he can your body? No, he can't. My body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And do you think I am? Here I stand. I'm not a tenement building. <laughs> God says, now I'll take this part and you can have that part. <laughs> God's got all of me. But I can still become sick because I am bound to human flesh until I am glorified. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. Let's look and see what the scripture says. It says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, this implies self-volition on the part of the devil. 
He was not cast out because if he had been cast out, the power that cast him out would have been strong enough to keep him out. But for one reason or another, he went out. A man tried to reform his life, so the devil plays along with him. And he left him for a while. <coughs> now then, notice. The spirit walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. Then he said to the devil, I will go back into my house. Well, I've got news for you. This is not his house. <laughs> I heard that. This is God's house. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells me that my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. What? Know ye not that ye are not your own? You have been bought with a price. Amen. Glory be to God forevermore. But the devil says, I will go back into my house from whence I am come out. And when he cometh, He findeth it in three things. Empty, swept, and garnished. A man had made a New Year's resolution, quit drinking, and joined the Rotary Club. <laughs> and that's not enough to keep the devil out. Amen. Now then, when he gets back to me, he won't find me empty, swept, or garnished. He'll find me full and blood-washed and attached to the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And there's nothing he can do about it. Amen. Glory be to God forever. Then, when he finds it in that shape, he goeth and take it with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Glory. Now you square your shoulders back, and you look the world straight on in the eye, and you don't go hunkered over, bowing and bobbing and scraping. You don't have to. There is nothing the devil can do about it. And if he thinks he can, I wish he'd quit picking on these poor old neurotic people. <laughs> that are always afraid to go to death. If he thinks he can possess a blood-washed Spirit-filled, Christ-serving man of God, then I, on this night, November 29, 1984, challenge every devil in hell, under hell, and above hell. Come into me. Oh, don't you think he'd like to? Don't you think he'd like to? Doesn't that make you afraid to challenge the devil like that? Not on your sweet life. There is nothing the devil can do about it. Glory be to his name forevermore. Now if he thinks he can do it, let him do it. There is no way he can do it. Because for him to get into me, he's got to say to the Lord, move on. I'm going to share that boy with you. And the Lord is not going to share me with anybody. Amen. I belong to Him. Amen. Glory. Now don't think, don't think strange when I hurl a challenge at the devil like that. That's just how mad I am at. <laughs> because I've been doing that very thing for over 40 years. And he's never got in yet and he never will. When I die, you can know that I was struck down by whatever may bring me to my death, but it won't be any devil that has done one lick of it. It'll be the fact that my time has come. And the Lord has said, Servant, Son of mine, come on home and be with me. I get tired 
and sick and hurt to see Christian people being urged into a position of fear and intimidation by preachers that ought to know better. You don't have to do it. You square your shoulders back. I like the story of Smith Wigglesworth. Oh, I like that. Old Smith Wigglesworth, South African saint of God, one of the greatest men of God ever lived. Heard a ruckus going on upstairs in the attic of his house, and he went up to see what it was, and when he got there, it was the devil. He saw the devil. And he said, oh, it's just you. <laughs> and turned around, went back down, and went to bed, and went to sleep. <laughs> You see, the devil is no more of a match for you than he is for Jesus Christ when you are in him. Well, now then healings and miracles, he will do it all. We're going to have a 15 minute break, then we're going to come back and I'm going to start on the ministry because I could go on for the rest of the week just on this right here. And I don't dare do it because I've got too much more uh, to cover. God bless you. The pack is asked about a Catholic uh, practice of exorcism. Exorcism is uh, something that has been carried on from time immemorial. It is a kind of uh, ceremonial casting out of devils, or at least attempting to cast out devils, or pretending to cast out devils. I'm not suggesting that the Catholics do that. But it is a ritual. It is a ritual that has been devised for doing it. The uh, first, the first uh, record we have of exorcism ritualistic casting out of devils is in the book of Acts when there were seven sons of Seba and the Bible calls them exorcists. These people went around casting out devils. They were professional casters out of devils. Now then, they had apparently, from what happened, we can construct this, come up with a formula an abracadabra, mumbo jumbo, hocus pocus kind of a thing, in which they wiggle their fingers probably in the face of some poor old neurotic. They sure never did come up against a guy with a real devil in it. And there's always, don't you ever fret, there's always, look, you can gather any people you want to, and there's a bunch of uh, neurotic people out there that'll give you whatever response you want. <laughs> And I used to worry about it. Why in the world do we get more than our share of them? Why don't the nuts go to the Episcopal Church? Why do they keep going to the Church of God? And so on. Well, I, I finally figured it out. You go out in the field somewhere and hang up uh, two dozen li electric lights. Make all of them 25-watt uh, bulbs. And right in the middle of it, put a 200-watt bulb. See where the bugs go. <laughs> the bugs will go to the powerful light. And so that's what I think to do. Now, these exorcists saw Paul casting out devils simply and clearly in the name of Jesus. He was really doing it. So they went out to cast out devils, and they said, In Jesus' name, whom Paul preaches, come out of the man. They added that word to their Abracadabra. And uh, this man really had him one. <laughs> now look, when you're going to go pretending to cast out devils, you be sure you just handle the neurotics. <laughs> or you be sure you have the real goods, because you're going to meet you a real one one of these days. And when you meet a real one, you better have the real goods yourself. And the devil reared up and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul I know, but who under high heaven are you? He never even heard of them. And the spirit that was in him seized him and he flailed into these seven boys and he beat them 
and sent them screaming out of there. I often say they tried to cast the devil out of him and he almost beat the devil out of them. <laughs> because they, they were as full of the devil as what, what they were trying to cast out. Exorcism then, in its simplicity, is a ritualistic formula for casting out devils. The Lord just simply calls upon us to take mastery over demons. Yes, I see a hand in the back. So I have a question pertaining to uh, speaking in tongues. There's such a great emphasis put on speaking in tongues, you know, it's like that there's like, you know, you have to do that in order to pertain to anything else. Do you have to say speak in tongues before you can have the uh, other gifts acting in your life or anything like that? And uh, also, how come is there such a great emphasis put on speaking in tongues in the church? The question is uh, why there is such an emphasis placed on speaking in tongues among uh, spirit-filled people. And uh, if it is necessary to speak with tongues in order to have the other gifts operating in your life. We, in looking at the instances, recorded instances in the Bible where people were baptized with the Holy Ghost, find without any exception that those who received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Jesus said, when he has come, he will testify of me. Giving testimony, of course, means to give affirmation, verbal affirmation of whatever you're testifying about. So on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says they all spoke with tongues. And uh, at the Ephesian outpouring, the Bible says when Simon saw and heard, now whatever happened, you see, was of such manifest uh, visibility that uh, he wanted this power. Well, the only thing you have there is the knowledge of what had happened on the day of Pentecost and then what is going to happen again at the baptism at the house of Cornelius. And at the house of Cornelius, they spoke with tongues. So in every record in the Bible, it shows the people under, the word is afflatus, under the afflatus of the Spirit speaking with tongues. That is a, an evidence, the evidence, the initial, the first primary evidence that the Holy Ghost has indeed done His baptizing work in your life. Now, the, uh, that is not the gift of tongues. That is not by any means the gift of tongues. That is a witness of tongues. That is a testimony of tongues. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that is a sure sign that He has come. But this gift of tongues is an entirely different thing. Because a gift of tongues is a, a giving of a message in tongues. And there are many, many evidences of people literally with their intellect understanding the language that is spoken. And uh, the message is always clear. And it is never gibberish. It is a message given in tongues. Now, those who receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit will speak in tongues in this witnessing act, but they will not necessarily speak in tongues thereafter. And that is another way people go overboard and hurt the cause by overemphasizing something the Bible does not say. I have heard people, mainly in Bible schools, because in the Bible schools you get people together who are zealous and they want to do right, they want to learn, and they want to be absolutely effective. And a lot of things, did you know the latter rain was born in a Bible school? 
And uh, several outbreaks of heresy were born in Bible schools. And that's not to condemn or even criticize or even discourage Bible schools. I'm just telling you that, that people are largely inexperienced and largely they are not knowledgeable in it. And so this is what I have seen happen. I've seen people get other people down to pray for them because they haven't spoken in tongues in two or three days. And I have seen one lay a guilt trip on another by saying, if the Holy Ghost is there, he'll talk every day. Now, by what authority do they say that? You have as much right to say, if the Holy Ghost is there, you will heal every day. Or if you have the Holy Ghost, you will do anything every day. The Holy Ghost does not work by our timepieces. Neither our clocks nor our calendars. And so when I was teaching at Lee College, I was hit with this very question. Someone reminded me of this in West Virginia this summer. How they came to me because they had not heard me speak with tongues. And I'm a teacher. And they wanted some answers. Real, real answers. And, uh, well, I've always heard that if the Holy Ghost is there, he'll talk every day. I said, well, that's interesting. I, I don't know where you find that in the Word of God. I said, the Holy Ghost speaks through me when he has something to say through me. He doesn't have a clock and say, uh oh, boy, I'm going to let 24 hours go by and have him spoke through Charles. <laughs> I better go down and say something. They said, well, maybe not by the clock, but what about, surely you will every month. I said, he don't have a calendar either. He doesn't say, hey, 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 I was thinking this, this month had 31 days and just had 28. I better go down and say something through it because I'm supposed to say something every month. That, isn't that ridiculous? He says something when he has something to say, and I am the vessel that he uses. The two most godly men that I have ever known, the most Christ-like I have ever known, I never heard speak with tongues. They did when they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. One was E.J. Bamer. One was G.R. Watson. The Lord used them in other ways. And I'm sure many times in their praying and in their devotions He did. But there was no public expression of it. So don't get all hung up about that. Just don't get hung up about it. Be yielded to the Lord. Amen. Let, me, let me tell you a little uh, something happened when I was president of Lee College. A fellow came into my office and said, Brother Khan said, we've been talking about you or Walker Hall. Now, that was a good place to be talking about. <laughs> of all the places in the world you don't want to be talking about, it's at Walker Hall. And so he said, we've been talking about you over at Walker Hall. He said, I just want to know, Brother Khan, what do you believe about holiness? I said, oh man, I believe in it. You do? I said, I sure do believe in it, man. He said, I do too. He said, I think you did. And I said, well, I do. He said, I do too. I'd die for it. I said, if I know my heart, I'd die for it too. He said, praise God. Wait till I tell him. And away he went. Never saw him again. I don't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever he had been talking about, I gave him the answer he wanted to hear. But I do believe in holiness and I would die for it. You understand? But I'm not sure that my understanding of what holiness is might be the same thing. I believe that his might be whether I played marbles or not. I don't know what, uh, what, what his thought was. But, but these kinds of uh, getting enthusiastic about it sometimes uh, uh, do inter intervene. Speaking in tongues occurs when you are baptized with the Holy Ghost as a sign and evidence that he has taken residence in you. Thereafter, he speaks according to his will, or he may manifest the gift of tongues through you so frequently that it looks to people as if you have the gift of tongues. The one that I know who speaks in tongues most often of all, my wife, has not even the faintest thought that God has ever given her a gift of tongues. He blesses her and magnifies himself in her with the giving of tongues. Is there any other question? 
Yes, Brother Casey. Brother Carmen, can the devil oppress a Christian? Well, when you talk about oppress, you're talking about a resisting of a Christian uh, through whatever means, of course. Of course he can. Uh, the devil did Jesus Christ. That's what the devil was doing when he sat uh, at the Lord's ear on the Mount of Temptation and kept whispering in his ear, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone to be turned into bread. And if thou be the Son of God, uh, uh, cast yourself off the pinnacle of the temple. And if thou be the Son of God, um, then uh, bow down, and, or not if thou be the Son of God, but if you'll fall down and worship me. Any kind, any kind of uh, approach the devil makes to us is definitely a form of oppressing us or opposing us or coming against us and very definitely the uh, way that that has been generally uh, discussed is uh, uh, I don't know who said it how long it's been said it's been around as long as I've been around and longer that you can't keep the birds from flying over your head but you can't keep them from making a nest in your hair and that that is it the devil yeah, the devil can come up to me and suggest that I uh, leap off a pinnacle of the temple. And I, I, when I go to Yosemite, I have to crawl up to the edge to look over at it. <laughs> and uh, so on. Yeah, I, I, he, can, he can do all of that. And he can also whisper to me that so-and-so doesn't like you. And so-and-so, oh boy, you have really ruined it now. Sometimes he might be right. He doesn't always tell a lie. Sometimes if, 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 uh, if uh, truth will hurt you more than a lie, he'll do that. Yes, he definitely can oppress. But that is opposing our uh, lives for Jesus Christ. And it takes many different kind of forms. Yes? Do you think all fear, does all fear come from the devil? Does all fear come uh, from the devil? No. Because we're told to fear the Lord. Fear is a healthy all. Now, that a fear that is a, uh, that is a paralyzing, morbid uh, thing is definitely uh, puts in us a condition in which the devil can bother us most. Now, I mentioned neurotics, and I don't mean to be hard on neurotics, but one of the signs of a neurotic is that he's always afraid of things. In uh, modern psychology, uh, they have narrowed the phobias of man uh, to a clean list of all the things people are afraid of. And in an understanding of psychology, they say that every man who is normal has about 2.6 phobias in his life. I know what my two are. <laughs> I have ophidiophobia. That's a dreadful fear of snakes. I don't care if he's purple, green, black, white, or pink. If he crawls on his belly and he's a snake, I won't know part of him. Well, that's fear, see? Another of mine is sinophobia. That is a fear of dogs. <laughs> One bit me when I was a boy, and since then I want no part of them. You understand? And if you want to keep me from coming to your house and giving you a tract, you just let a big old dog lie asleep on your porch, and I won't bother you. You understand? And uh, those, there are phobias. These are fears. Now, I think what you're talking about, however, is just a nameless, vague, dread, the devil would like to fill us with a dread and a uh, compulsive kind of fear of anything and everything. Uh, that would not be demon possession, but definitely that would be one of the one of the devices the devil would use against us. Definitely. Is there any other uh, question? Brother, yes. Can a person be oppressed to the point that it changes their behavior to make it similar like possession? Can a person be oppressed to the point that they would change their behavior and it would appear to be possession? I don't know really what a person would uh, appear to have possession would be like. The people that I've seen that are possessed of the devil sometimes are clean-shaven, clear-talking, bright-eyed. 
but yet they are agents of the devil. You understand? Now then, if oppression means only that I become excessively cautious, definitely that would affect uh, my uh, behavior. I told you the other day that I have had a recent battle with vertigo. Has anybody in here ever had vertigo? It's an inner ear disorder that causes you to lose balance. Well, I, I have uh, seen the times that I had to brace myself, even in the pulpit to preach, to be sure that I did not uh, lose my balance, even as I stood up to preach. And uh, so that altered my, my behavior. You understand? Because I have to steal myself or steady myself to see that I don't weave uh, as I'm driving a car or as I do something. My wife and I have real discussions about this. I'll be complaining as we drive along wood on the way home from the assembly about my vertigo and she'd say, well, here, honey, uh, let me drive. And I'll say, no, I'm not that sick. And uh, <laughs> she... She can drive, but I just don't be in there with her when she does it. You understand? <laughs> she says I'd be willing for her to drive from home to California as long as she's by herself. But when I get in there, I'll drive. Thank you. I'll drive. And that's just one of those little quirks that I have. Um, I think oppression. I think oppression uh, can actually at times uh, alter your behavior. Maybe it even be good for you sometimes. If it makes you, uh, look, I'm aware of the devil and his devices. Remember, the Lord tells us that. We are not ignorant of his devices, and we know the wiles of the devil. Amen. And if we know them, we are going to be careful not to fall into his traps. Amen. <coughs> I'm sorry that we have uh, allowed our time to get away from us. I promise you tomorrow morning we will start. What time did you say tomorrow morning? 9.45. 9.45. And we will, we will handle the rest of it. So I promise you that. So we're just going to give the rest of tonight. We've got, don't, don't you go to leave it on me. <laughs> if you start watching the clock, I'm going to quit watching it. But if you will, if you will forget it, I'll keep it in my mind. Okay? Is that fair enough? Okay. But no need of both of us watching it. All right. Is there any other question that you have about the gifts of the Spirit? It is so urgent that we have an understanding of what the Lord wants us to know. Is there any question that you have? Yes. Oh, other way. Dr. Kahn, sometimes we uh, have been asked uh, by uh, some people that are not Pentecostal, why uh, can they be effective in sharing Christ with others, but yet are not filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, with evidence in speaking in other tongues, but yet their ministries can be very effective in uh, reaching people, evangelizing, and uh, then we compare what they are doing with people that are Pentecostal, they speak in tongues, and do basically the same thing. Now the question is, why are people sometimes more effective in their witnessing for Christ without the baptism than we are with it? That happens very often, and uh, let me give you two answers for that. Unfortunately, I find among Pentecostals sometimes a class inferiority complex. We have allowed the world to convince us that we are not quite as knowledgeable and so on. That pushes us back. For instance, one of my children moved to a town recently and immediately went to the Church of God. The Church of God pastor got up and laid before the people a request for an offering as a test of their faith. In other words, uh, if you don't give, something bad is going to happen to you. And uh, giving is a way of bringing the blessing of the Lord. They discovered that uh, my uh, daughter 
is my daughter. And they made quite a, quite a, boy, that, that was really important to them that everybody know that this is Charles Conn's daughter, which she wanted to be just who she was. And uh, that was the last. They never came to see her, never followed up. The very next Sunday, she went to a Baptist church. They welcomed her, received her. And by Monday night, the very next day, the pastor had been to visit her. And two or three of the members had been to visit her to urge her to come back. Now, why didn't the church God people do that? Why are we so timid? Why are we so afraid to do what we're supposed to do? That's one reason they sometimes do more, is because they exert more effort. Another reason is that the others sometimes have a greater sense of social needs and therefore they emphasize that. Sometimes you go to a place, and I've mentioned this this week, what's wrong with us when we allow a degenerate, unsaved, profane neighbor do more for the good of the neighborhood than we who are spirit-filled and should be doing more. We draw our skirts around us, find fellowship among ourselves, and never get out there and try to reach it. The fault is ours. The fault is ours. I think God baptizes every one of us to get out there and influence the world, impact the world for Jesus Christ. I hope that is uh, covering the question you'd ask. Yes? Dr. Kahn, uh, when, you, when dealing with interpretation of tongues, when you have a prophecy that goes forward, who do you think should be the one that should do the judging to find out whether that person is, is in fact, is from the Lord, the prophecy that's done? Generally, the question is, uh, who is to judge? Let us judge, said Paul. Generally, that would be the minister. Uh, generally, because the Lord, as we'll see tomorrow when we get to this, it is here that the Lord has reposed the directive authority. And uh, I, for one, feel that it is my responsibility if things begin to get out of order in speaking in tongues, that I bring it back in order. Now, I'll tell you one thing. You're going to run into a lot of criticism when you do it. Because you've always got some people that are going to accuse you of being unspiritual and that ever-present accusation of being liberal. <laughs> and they'll go to the state overseer on you. And they'll accuse you of other things. And that you're trying to quench the spirit. I was pastor of a church one time and a girl I found out at high school had been telling all of her classmates to be sure to be there on a certain night. She's going to be the one to speak. So what she didn't tell me. And so the only way she could do it is get started before I was wise to what was going on. So man, she got up and she started out. And she was supposedly in the spirit. And she said, yeah, you high school kids, you treat us snotty. And I turned to my wife and I said, boy, the Lord uses untasteful language. And got up and stopped it. You understand? That, that was out of order, and I dealt with it as I was supposed to do. But I did have a complainer or two at the office, day office the next morning because I'd quench the spirit. Yeah, it's mainly up to the preacher to do that. Uh, one of our ministers, John Nichols, who's now overseer of Florida, he and I have worked together a lot of times. He's one of the most, well, if you know him, he's a Californian. <laughs> he is one of the most physical preachers I've ever heard. And he preaches loud and he 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 is he demonstrates very much. But let me tell you, I have never seen anybody take his service away from him with shouting. He just stands back and says, Go ahead. Shout as long as you want to. 
But when you finish, I'm going to finish this sermon. I'm not going to let you shut me up with an outbreak of shouting. I like that. You know what? We are supposed to see that the Word of God and nothing uh, else dominates our services. Now, I'm not talking about worship. Worship, 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 worship. But let it be in accordance with the Word of God. It's the responsibility belongs mainly to the minister. Amen. God bless you. We'll be back at 9.45. 9.45 a.m. And uh, I will not mention anything further about the gifts. We're going to get right on the ministry tomorrow morning. Okay? God bless you.